I would like to request you all to kindly permit me to just take very few minutes of extra time this morning because the topic I ended uh, with last time was such a huge topic, but I try my best to keep it uh, as short as possible and I'll, uh, it really put test to my skills of, uh, like as pastor calls, art of deletion. I did my best uh, and <laughs> after that I'm bringing the thing that I can bring. Uh, so I'll try my best to conclude it uh, soon in case if I take a few minutes extra kindly. Uh, permit me. Along with that, let me tell you, uh, if you have uh, any questions, please feel free to ask me after the service, you know, because it is such an important subject as well as uh, such a complicated subject to explain within the limited time that we have. So, the topic of my message was the last sentence of my ser uh, sermon uh, last week. Does God require human sacrifice? Couple of years ago, a family in Chittur district, Andhra Pradesh, have sacrificed two of their young children. One among them was 20, the other one was 17. They killed them inside the house as a ritual uh, to worship their god. And uh, they have buried both children. And in fact, uh, uh, the gap between both uh, deaths were around two weeks. And the first they have uh, sacrificed one and they buried the body inside the house and again they took time and they convinced the children that what they are doing is a service towards God and the children, they believed it and have given their lives uh, as part of uh, the ritual worship. And we, this incident has shook Andhra and Telangana and in all the news uh, channels you might have heard this news. Does God really seek sacrifice? Thinking about it is so very difficult in our hearts. I myself, as I'm speaking, I could feel something is being uh, uh, like, you know, uh, you know, something like, it is such a difficult thing even to imagine and to talk about. Does God require human sacrifice? Many people who accuse Christianity, uh, Christianity, they say that Christianity is a cult of human sacrifice. And we think so many other pagan religions are, human, are offering human sacrifices. But a lot of uh, critics of Christianity, they say Christianity is a cult that has human sacrifice in its, as a center of worship. And Christianity is not a religion that uh, uh, repu uh, sorry, repudiates human sacrifice, but it celebrates one human sacrifice. I'm talking about the death of Jesus. Christianity is against all sacrifices, animal sacrifices, which we read in the Old Testament. But we all celebrate the death of a human, Jesus Christ. Is truly Christianity as a cult that celebrates human sacrifice. The death of Jesus appears to many as human sacrifice. This raises the question, does God seek human sacrifice? Not just the pagan uh, deities, but the Christian God, does he also seek human sacrifice? Does he seek human sacrifice so badly where he has to sacrifice his own son, not just the children of others? Sacrifice his own son to satisfy his wrath, to satisfy the requirements of his righteousness and justice in order to provide forgiveness to the world. Does he require it? The answer we can find in the Bible, but we need to explore. In the Bible, we find in Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 31, here it is written, God says, You shall not behave thus towards the Lord your God, for every abominable act which the Lord hates, they have done for their gods, for they even burn their sons and daughters in the fire, of fire, uh, in the, uh, fire to their gods. Here, the God, God is speaking about the pagan gods of uh, 
uh, you know pagan go pagan gods of those times and he says those who were demanding for human sacrifice and these people they were offering human sacrifices but you shall not do like that and in Deuteronomy 18:10 we can find uh, they shall be no, so they shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire or one who practices witchcraft or sorcery or one who interprets omens or sorcerers here god tells again commands that you should not be having human sacrifices among you in Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 30 and 31 here it says for the children of Judah have done evil in my sight says the Lord they have said their abominations in the house which is called by my name to pollute it the children of Israel were polluting the house of the Lord that's what he says and they have built the high places to Tophet who is a deity of pagan pagan deity which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom to burn their sons and their daughters in fire which I did not command nor did I come into my heart here he says the children of Judah were offering some human sacrifices I never commanded they are doing all these abominations in my sight and I never commanded them to do that and such a thing never entered in my thought also is there anything that does not enter in God's mind and this is such an evil thing that can that was that was even not enter into God's mind and God never asked in his worship for a human sacrifice he never thought of such that's what the scripture says if God is like that if God is a God who does not even have the human sacrifice in as a thought in his mind then how should we look at the death of Jesus Christ who was a human offered himself as a sacrifice in order to understand this, we need to understand what sacrifice is. Unless we understand the, what the sacrifice better, unless we understand the purpose of sacrifice, we won't be even able to understand the purpose of Jesus' sacrifice. If you look at the Old Testament, oh sorry, before that, let me share with you a couple of common thoughts about sacrifices. There are so many, but these two are the most common uh, thoughts about uh, sacrifices first thing is sacrifice is essentially a way of dealing with the problem of sin if any sin is there a sacrifice has to be offered this is a common understanding of not just Christians most of the people in the world and the sacrifice deals with sin by causing God to stop being angry with us Sacrifice has to be offered, otherwise God will be angry. In order to, key, to calm God and to turn God's anger down, you need to offer a sacrifice. So, sacrifice deals with sin is number one. Number two, by offering sacrifice, we can turn God's anger uh, down. If we can cool God, He will be satisfied. Uh, don't, don't, don't you feel many Christians speak the same? God was so very angry because you have committed sin. And God will be very angry just when, while he was angry looking at your sin. Uh, Jesus asked him, hello father, here I am. Just think, uh, look at, look at uh, the cross on which I died 2000 years ago. Then God looks at the sacrifice of Jesus and he calms himself down. <sighs> okay, okay, he died. So... Okay, come on, come on. Uh, and he, I mean, then he hugs, hugs and embraces us. Is it not many Christians do speak? <laughs> many times we hear the same. The wrath of God was satisfied when Jesus died on the cross. The wrath of God was satisfied. We sing, not just say, we sing about it. We are say, speaking the same thing. Okay, but in reality, neither Old Testament nor the New Testament support these two assumptions. Please don't uh, pick up stones. Let me, I will give you my clarification. <laughs> neither Old Testament nor New Testament support these two perspectives. Sacrifice does sometimes have something to do with sin, but dealing with sin is not its main objective. Sometimes sacrifice deals with sin, but dealing with sin is not its main objective. And God does get angry sometimes, but 
sacrifice does not relate to god's anger so you can plan if you have to stone me there are various purposes behind old testament sacrifices which can show a way for us to understand new testament sacrifice sacrifice was i mean offered to express their gratitude towards god that's one purpose offering was added for a prayer that has been answered or promised now ajay came and spoke praised god that is a sacrifice for god heard our prayers you know children sometimes when we got a beautiful children we we were blessed with children we bring them to the temple of the lord right in those days when they get a gift they go to the temple of the lord and offer sacrifice but if god answered somebody's prayer mokulu go they go and offer sacrifices okay and some people they they are blessed so the free will they want to give an offering which we are going to collect end of the service okay that's how people are bringing sacrifices in those days and this is one category of sacrifices there is there are two more categories of sacrifices wow and these first three which i mention now they are related to worship and next uh, sacrifice is purification sacrifice if somebody was passed away and if they come in contact with the dead then they have to purify themselves in order to do that they used to offer sacrifice in the old testament that is called purification sacrifice which cleans the unclean and there is another sacrifice which we talk the more and understand the less which is a uh, compensation offering you know somebody have done something wrong in order to provide restitution not retribution kindly don't misunderstand my words i'm not talking about retribution somebody committed sin somebody have done something wrong in order to provide restitution restore them back the compensation was offered and similar uh, that that is another kind of sacrifice which we can call compensation offering and one example for that is day of atonement day of, on day of atonement the pre high priest used to offer sacrifices for all the sins of the country where they have done either knowing or unknowingly they used to offer so that the restitution may be happened people are suffering with guilt by the offering of the sacrifice their conscience may be clear and for one year they can their conscience may be cleared and so that they can come to the temple of the lord and worship him again this is compensation offering that is day of atonement we 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 compare jesus death with the day of atonement isn't it okay having said that in reality as i said sacrifice uh, sacrifice sometimes deal with sin but their main objective is not to deal with sin they do deal with i mean god gets anger but sacrifice is not the solution for god's anger okay so having said that in reality what happens is none of these sacrifices whatever the sacrifices i have mentioned uh, they de- none of these sacrifices will deal with the real sin sacrifice no because sacrifice was not designated to deal with the real sin basically if you had worshiped another god or set fire to someone's house and you came to the temple and offered a sacrifice does it solve the problem no what is the problem the heart is the problem right a sacrifice cannot provide solution for the sin you would offer an appropriate purification offering and compensation offering as well but the more basic solution for the problem remains in repentance and forgiveness not in sacrifice we may be offering appropriate sacrifices but solution can come only when the sinner he was repented and receives the forgiveness from god we simply have to repent and cast ourselves on god's mercy you know that god we we uh, believing that god is a god of love and compassion and not just uh, you know 
uh, God who desires for sacrifices, God of love and compassion, with that attitude, if you come before God, He forgives. That provides solution, not the sacrifice. That is the reason the scripture we read, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 14, it is written, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Did you read these words? Many a times we think the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away the sin. That's why we need to bring a human sacrifice. That's why Jesus came and offered himself. Sorry. So, we are demanding human sacrifice because we are believing the goats cannot clear our skin. Uh, sorry, clear our sin. But the, re, the, re, the answer for this is, this words was misunderstood. This words doesn't say goat's blood could not take away. That's why human sacrifice should be provided. No, that's not what it means. It means sacrifice could not deal with the sin. That's what it is saying, basically. And that's why Psalm 51 verse 16, we all know Psalm 51 very well. Psalm 51 speaks about the repentance of David after committing uh, adultery with uh, Bathsheba and his, his son was born and dead, right? That is the time he wrote Psalm 51, so was, uh, Psalm of Repentance, in which he says, You do not desire sacrifice or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offerings. David understood. God does not delight or want sacrifices. Why? Why God doesn't want uh, delight in sacrifices? Because that is not the solution for his sin. Why David was not offering sacrifices? Is he lacking anything? Nothing. He has everything. He can offer thousands of rams and goats and bulls. But he says that you do not desire them. Otherwise I would have offered. Because David understood these are not going to help me anything. And in the same chapter what he says, you know, God loves the contrite heart, the broken heart. Which means God loves the repented heart, the heart that turns towards him, that depends on him. That's what David says. Because David understood the sacrifices cannot provide solution for sin. Only repentance and forgiveness can do that. And that's why Hebrews chapter 10, verses 8 to 10, which we read, this is part of it. Sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and offerings for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, in bracket it is written, which are offered according to the law, the list we, we read in the Old Testament. Okay. Then he said, look at this, this is the more important thing. Behold, I have come to do you, your will, O God. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. Have you noticed this verse? He takes away the first and establishes the second. What is that first thing he is taking away? The offerings of the bulls, rams, burnt offerings and all. You do not desire. And he takes them away because they are not the solution. And he brings the second thing. What is the second thing? What is that he introduces? Not just introduces, he's, it is, the word it is used was establish. He takes away the first and establishes the second. The second thing is, um, by that we will have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Jesus offered himself as a body of sacrifice once for all. What he meant by that is the obedience of Jesus Christ. It does not mean any animal, animal, God takes away the animal sacrifice and uh, introduces human sacrifices. It means sacrifices could not do any, any help. That's why he removed sacrifices altogether. Only thing that helps is someone living completely obedient life. And who can live for all people in this world? That is none, none other than Jesus alone. In him all things are created. In him all things consist. He is alone suitable person to live on behalf of you and me. He is alone able to be obedient on behalf of you and me, which we are calling vicarious humanity of Jesus Christ. He is able to live. So this is not talking about animal sacrifices uh, because they could not solve. But it is talking about Jesus and his obedience. According to this, Jesus' death is not like any other sacrifices. 
many a time we try to fit jesus under the image of these sacrifices old testament is an image of the new testament right old testament is a shadow of jesus christ do you bring uh, reality under shadow or you do interpret shadow in the light of reality which is superior reality is superior, superior or the shadow is superior obviously reality is superior so unfortunately what we do is we try to fit the reality which is the new testament reality of jesus under the old testament shadow of these so-called sacrifices and that is where we are making mistakes to consider and to present jesus as a human sacrifice unto the lord let me repeat them, my, my, my statement again. We consider Jesus Christ was a human sacrifice unto the Lord. The first system is not useful. That's why the second system was used, which is the obedience according to the will of God and which Jesus Christ offered. And that's why in Old Testament there is another scripture that comes to our mind. Obedience is better than sacrifice. God said to Saul, he offered sacrifices, but what God was saying, obedience is better than sacrifices because sacrifices do not offer any solution. Considering Jesus' sacrifice like in penal substitutionary atonement theory, which is, I know I used a big word, which means to say that God is so angry and he is the court judge and uh, uh, we all have committed sin. Jesus on our behalf received the punishment from God so that we may be forgiven. That is called penal substitution atonement theory. Jesus received our punishment from God upon himself. Okay? Saying this is just like saying Jesus' death is like human sacrifice. You know, have you seen this picture anytime? This is from a, this is from a ritual from Kerala. Okay, this ritual is called uh, uh, Kutti Atam of Chural Muriel ritual. If anyone knows Malayalam, you can tell, you can understand, and you can help us understand also. Kuti Atam of Chural Muriel ritual, which is symbolic of human sacrifice. Which is symbolic of human sacrifice unto the goddess of death. What difference are we making between these Kuti Atam and Jesus? We are also symbolically saying Jesus' death was on our, uh, you know, death was a punishment he received on our behalf. We are making it similar. That is so unfortunate. From which we can understand one thing from whatever we discussed till now, that God did not ask for any sacrifice. It is very clear in the book of Isaiah and Jeremiah. And in some places he says, I hate your sacrifices. I never asked you for any sacrifices, he says. And uh, he does not like sacrifices. David said that. Okay, even Isaiah, Jeremiah, and people have committed sin and all. Uh, we can understand what happened to David. David is the one who is after God's own heart. And he tells God does not ask for sacrifice, seek for sacrifice. And, and God chooses the other method which we read in Hebrews chapter 10. He did not choose the sacrifices, but he chooses the obedient person which he, for which Jesus came and offered himself for a, uh, to live an obedient uh, person on, on behalf of all of us. That does not mean Jesus' death is not a sacrifice. It is a sacrifice. If God does not seek for any sacrifice, if God does not ask for any sacrifice, uh, then to whom did Jesus offer his sacrifice? Right? God, God is not interested in them. But to whom uh, this sacrifice was offered? This human sacrifice was offered. Think about it. Is it to Satan? Satan demands human sacrifice? Who the hell is he to demand? <laughs> The answer is humans. We seek human sacrifice. It's not God who sought human sacrifice. 
human sacrificed him to satisfy their religious and political reasons and intentions and requirements isn't it the gospels you read caiaphas why did he condemn jesus he prophesied one should die for the nation in john book of john for their religious purposes their political purposes they they have their own intentions because jesus was gaining so much of popularity among the religious world of israel of those days they want to kill him <laughs> one should die for the nation it's a political sacrifice caiaphas planned it who sacrificed jesus it is humans it is not god god is not in the business of killing people god is not in the business of killing his son many a times we read this word very badly god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believed in him shall not perish but have eternal life but he did not give his son to be killed he gave his son to live obediently on your and my behalf so that through his obedience all of us may be accepted but we humans were so very uncomfortable with this righteous and holy person who came into this world could not tolerate and killed they killed. that's why people killed jesus why am i saying humans are the ones seeking human sacrifice remember the sermon last week i preached who was seeking human sacrifice was it abraham or god it was abraham who was so very comfortable to kill his son that's when god intervenes and says abraham abraham hold on don't hurt him you shall not offer human sacrifice it is humans who are seeking human sacrifice but it is not god how is it how is it possible it is by the voluntary giving of jesus of course jesus voluntarily offered himself to satisfy our wrath when jesus died god's wrath was not satisfied when jesus died human wrath was satisfied caiaphas pilot or whoever the people they were satisfied it was not god and if his anger is going to be satisfied jesus would have not said father into your hands i commit my spirit if god's anger have to be satisfied he he won't raise him up from the dead he raised him up from the dead which tells he it's, it is not his anger he is satisfying but it is the anger of the human who cried out saying crucify him crucify him their wrath was satisfied it is like uh, you know people like you know our spouse had very bad day at workplace and totally frustrated and very angry the spouse came home and released all the anger on the <laughs> partner and the partner silently absorbed all the anger and suffered the anger of the partner and after they released all the anger they absorbed everything completely and kept calm and quiet in without instead of fighting back received all the pain then both of them can have a peaceful dinner that is how jesus offered his sacrifice we humans were suppressed by sin and we humans could not tolerate a holy man and righteous man and we are so angry and released all our anger upon him and he received everything and he said father forgive them for they do not know what they do and he absorbed everything and he rose again from the dead and he said i forgive you and he is not counting them back that's how he received our anger and it is like a young child a young girl rebelled against the parents and fought with the parents and married a person who was really very bad who was a gangster and went and they they got a child and then the gangster left her uh, on the road and by then the parents they settled okay previously we had less rooms now we have entire house for ourselves they were getting comfortable and the daughter returns and the parents they received her daughter and the grandchild so happily 
and again adjust in the small spaces in the house and uh, treat her strengthen her and she becomes strong and uh, become independent to take care of her child till then they take care of the child of the daughter also that is how just as these parents absorbed the suffering and they absorbed the pain of the daughter and they adjusted they suffered the pain in order to accommodate the daughter god accepted each and every one of us and he strengthened us so that we can become independent just like the girl who became independent so in these two cases the case about the angry spouse who came back home and the girl who the rebellious girl who returned home in these two cases both of these two offenders they are healed isn't it both of them are healed and what would happen the girl after returning do you think she will be again rebellious no her heart or her attitude towards the family changes right that is the solution for sin isn't it that is what god is doing with you and me as jesus has absorbed all our anger jesus absorbed all our wrath upon himself and he offered forgiveness to us and he is offering by his spirit repentance to us the dear, that is why uh, we can say that death of jesus did not change god minds about us but the death of jesus changes our mind about god god was the same from yesterday today and forever his attitude never changed people who say god was so angry that's why jesus has to come offer himself as sacrifice and to calm him down remind him god so loved the world that he gave his only son it is not like god so angry about the world that's why he gave his son so that his anger can be satisfied it is not god who sought the sacrifice and human sacrifice and it is humans we did that and that's why the cross of jesus demands your and my repentance it doesn't change god's mind it cha- it changes our mind about god that's why scripture continuously demands us to repent change your mind not god so compensation was paid by jesus and suffering was taken by jesus and repentance and forgiveness was offered to us so that we may be healed that is the absolute solution for sin in this world not the blood of animals nor even the blood of humans that's why hebrews 9:22 it says and according to the law almost all things are purified with blood and without shedding blood there is no remission of sin why this remission of sin it is to cleanse the conscience to do a clean a cleaning it is god who requires it's or it's not god who requires the blood to offer forgiveness and sin but it is we require the sacrifice and the blood to accept forgiveness or to clear our conscience there is no free lunch that's what people say right we are not able to accept the forgiveness of god freely that's why we require the sacrifice of jesus that's why the word sacrifice has been used metaphorically in new testament okay if you have any questions about it please ask me don't pick up stones please <laughs> okay <laughs> the blood of jesus cleanses our conscience hebrews 9 verse 14 it says how much more shall the blood of christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to god cleanses your conscience from dead works to serve the living god cleaning conscience and serving god isn't it the solution for sin how is it happening it is by the blood of jesus which cleansed our conscience it is not cleansed god's conscience he was angry now he became happy it is us this solves the problem cleanses the conscience and make us to leave the dead works does god require human sacrifice no who saw who sought for the human sacrifice we and god he offered he is in the business of giving his own life so that you and me you and i may live the zoe life which greg williams spoke 
Having said that, with your permission, can I add the last perspective? What is the purpose of these sacrifices? The Hebrew word for sacrifice is korban. The Arabic word also is korban, from which our Urdu and Hindu, uh, Hindi words came, kurban. You know, what is the meaning of the word korban or kurban? Kurban doesn't mean killing an animal on the on an altar. Kurban means bring close. Bring close, bring near, draw near. And this word appears 40 times in book of Leviticus itself. And 38 times in Numbers. And two times in Ezekiel. Book of Leviticus is full of the word sacrifice, right? And this word takes the major part. 40 times it is written. Kurban means bring near. Okay. This indicates the purpose of God, sacrifice is not to come, come, you know, calm the angry God. But God is asking us to bring sacrifice so that we may come close to him. To bring near to himself. That's why he is asking. And you know, the sacrifice is the primary form of worship in those days. We, we studied in Genesis 22 in the last week. First time the word sacrifice, uh, sorry, first time the word worship was used while Abraham was going to offer his son as sacrifice. So the word sacrifice was substituted with the word worship. In the, we are singing and saying hallelujah and these were singing what all. But in ancient uh, Israel and all, their worship was not this. Their worship was primarily offering a sacrifice. That was the primary worship. So the, uh, sorry, the purpose of this sacrifice is worship. In worship, we come close to God. Have you ever thought why these uh, sacrifices are always about food? You give an animal sacrifice. Why don't you give gold sacrifice? You need to offer sacrifice of a bird. You need to offer sacrifice of flour. Wheat flour, you need to go and offer sacrifice. You need to give offering of oil. You give sacrifice of sugarcane, sweet. What is this? And not only in uh, Israel, take anywhere in the world, in the pagan old cultures. Why always food is offered to God? Why not other things? Because food is the best thing that sets up good time to be together. If you want to talk to somebody, what you can do? Hey, come over to our house for lunch. Come over to our house for dinner. Let's meet up, meet up over coffee. What does it mean? Drink coffee and go? No. Let us come together, stick together, stick to the chair, and have quality conversation. Come together. That is the purpose of the word sacrifice, korban. And that is part of worship. And in Deuteronomy, God gave uh, instructions how we should worship and how we should not worship. In Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 29 to 31, here he says how we should not worship. He says, when the Lord your God cuts off from, uh, sorry, when the Lord your God cuts off from before you the nations which you go to, <coughs> uh, which you go to dispossess, and you displace them and dwell in their land, take heed to yourself that you are not ensnared to follow them after they are destroyed from before you and that you do not inquire after their gods, saying, how did these nations serve their gods? I also will do likewise. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way, for every abomination to the Lord which he hates, they have done to their gods, for they burn even their sons and daughters in fire to their gods. This is how the pagans were worshipping in those days. You should not do that. That's what God says. And how should we worship? In the same chapter it is explained. Deuteronomy chapter 12 verse 10 to 14. But when you cross over the Jordan and dwell in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to inherit, and he gives you rest from all your enemies around, uh, around about, so that you dwell in safety, 
then there will be the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide. You cannot go like pagans and worship sacrifice anywhere. You have to worship, provide sacrifice only in a particular place that God shows. There you shall bring all that I command you, you burn, your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, uh, the heave of sorry the heave offerings of your hand and your choice offering which you owe to the land and you shall rejoice you shall rejoice before the lord your god you and your sons your daughters your male and your female servants what you have to do you bring whatever you want to bring to sacrifice bring the animals bring whatever food you want to bring bring it to the temple then what you should have to do you do you need to give the uh, food to the god no come to my house and eat with your children your brothers and sisters and rejoice in other words bring lunch to the church and eat that's what god is asking that's how you should worship okay and let me tell you, here comes uh, one of the important points. And the Levite who is within your gates, since he has no portion, no inheritance with you. <laughs> when you bring lunch to the church, don't forget Praveen. <laughs> I like fish. <laughs> and God tells, you bring your food to the temple and eat with your family. That's how you should worship. And not only this, in the same chapter. However, you may slaughter and eat meat with all your gates, whatever your heart desires, according to the blessings of the Lord your God, which he has given you, the unclean and the clean may eat of it, of the gazelle and the deer alike. Only you shall not eat the blood, you shall pour it on the earth like water. You may not eat within your gates the tithes of your grain. You may not eat your tithes within your gates or your grain or your new wine or your oil of the firstborn of your herd of your flock of any of your offerings which you vow or your free will offerings or of the heave offerings of your hand but you must eat them before the lord your god you bring all this to my house and you eat there that's how god is asking us to worship him He's not asking, come to my house and jump and <laughs> jump and sing and tell how great I am. He said, come here, you bring whatever you have. <laughs> Eat in my house. Just like Father calls the children who are spread all over you know, various places. Just like Father who calls the children who were spread in various parts. You know, we have children who, were, who went to other parts, I mean other cities and countries. We call them, come for Christmas. Why? When they eat at home, we'll be happy. The moment the children come, father and mother, they want to bring their best and give their best. Because when they eat in their presence, they will be happy. <laughs> that is what God is asking. That pleases the Lord. And he said, you must eat them before the Lord your God in the place which the Lord your God chooses. Okay? You and your sons and your daughters, your male servants and your female servants, and the Levite, don't forget, who is within your gates <laughs> and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God in all to which you put your hands take heed to yourself that you do not forsake the Levite as long as you live in your hand right. bring it to the church and eat it with your brothers and don't forget the Levite I like fish <laughs> that's how God wants us to worshiping what does a sacrifice do sacrifice brings people close to God as we offer sacrifice we are coming to the house of the Lord and we are eating in his presence that's why in John chapter 6 verse 53 and 58 Jesus said and Jesus said to them most assuredly I say to you unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and the drink his blood you have no life in you Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, for my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, 
and I live because of the Father. So he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. Communion. That's the purpose of sacrifice. This God who doesn't seek human sacrifice, but he wants to be the source of the coming together, center of coming together, and center of fellowship. And uh, may I request Nelson's family to bring the bread and wine that has been prepared so that we all may partake in the bread and wine which was symbolizing the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ which has been offered so that we all may come close in the house of the Lord. We all may come close to God and we may partake in it together as one family. He said, bring your ch boy children, male children, female children, and your female servant, male servant, and eat in my presence. Now we as the family of God, we have our brothers and sisters here. We all are going to partake in the food that God has prepared for us so that we may come close to him and with close with one another. Let us offer a prayer for Nelson's family. Thank you so much for the deacon services and other services you are offering towards the church. It is our honor to uh, bless you and pray for you. Father, we stand in your presence thanking you so very much for Nelson and the Phillips family, O oh Lord, for their services towards the church and uh, the leadership they are providing. Definitely, Lord, they have been such a blessing to us. Lord, I pray your special grace may be upon the family so that they may be blessed in every aspect of their lives, O oh Lord, and you bless them in their careers and they may reach better heights and may glorify your name, Lord. Bless them with good health. Bless the children as well, Lord. I pray as Jessica is... Uh, leaving the country, your special presence may be with her, Lord. Wherever she goes, she may find favor. And as Nathan is growing up, I pray that uh, he may grow in wisdom and stature and in understanding and the favor of men. I also pray, Lord, your grace may be given to Mrs. Phillips so that she may be able to live comfortably and may bless your holy name in her senior years, Lord. And I pray your special blessings upon Nelson and Joshua in their workplaces. They may find favor from superiors, subordinates, as well as colleagues everywhere, Lord. They may, they may be flourished and they may glorify your name. Thank you very much for the family. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. This is the bread symbolizing the blood, the body of Jesus Christ. And this is the wine symbolizing the blood of Jesus Christ. And both of them, they remind us about the sacrifice Jesus offered. Not to make God happy, but to make us happy. Not, not to, uh, you know, satisfy the bloodthirsty God, but to bring all of us into his family to his presence and to dine with uh, brothers and sisters in his house. So, as the uh, blood and body, uh, sorry, wine of Jesus Christ and the communion is in our midst, let us pray. Before, let us pray, and we'll partake in it. O oh, merciful God, we do not presume to come to this table trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear son Jesus Christ and to drink the blood and uh, that we may live evermore and dwell with him in your presence and he in us. Amen. This is a table, not of the church, but of the Lord. And it is for those who love him and for those who want to love him more. 
so come you who have more much faith and you who have little come you who have been here often and who have not been here often it is the lord who is inviting you to participate with him to break bread with him in his house I would like to invite all of you to come before uh, the table and collect your elements so that we all and retain it with you so that we all as one family can partake in it together brethren the body of our lord jesus christ which was given for you preserve your body and soul unto your everlasting life take and eat this in remembrance that christ died for you and feed on him in thy heart by faith with thanksgiving the bread of jesus christ the blood of our lord jesus christ which was shed for you preserve your body and soul unto everlasting life drink this in remembrance that christ's blood was shed for you and be thankful mm -hmm.